What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. We've got a, uh, we've got a fun, world-changing question this week, and I'm ready to dive right in if you guys are. I am ready. I guess I'm oh, ready. Good. Ben, ben <laughs> did not respond, so Ben, <laughs> ben is not ready. Like, <laughs> I mean, ben, hello? Are you on the, are you on the call? Yeah, are you I'm here? probably ready. Sure, why not? So our, our question this week is, what if land and water swapped? So what do we mean by this? The way we decided to do this after much debate was we did it by elevation. Basically, anything with a positive elevation above sea level became negative and vice versa, and the sea stayed at sea level. So if you have something that was 20 feet below the ocean before, it's now 20 feet above the ocean. So imagine you look at the big world map, everything that was ocean is now land, everything that is land is now ocean. And the last thing... We're treating this kind of as if it was more or less always this way. This wasn't like an overnight change, so not everyone's dead again. So <laughs> <laughs> this will be this will be one of our less murderous episodes. A pretty easy answer if it was overnight. <laughs> Everyone would die overnight. Yeah, at least at least from my perspective, this is one of the less deadly episodes. I don't know what you guys did yet, but we'll find out. So I, I kind of just went base level. What does the world kind of look like now? And what are some cool parts about it? So the first thing I want to look at is the extremes. The highest elevation in the world is, of course, Mount Everest. Mount Everest sits 29,035 feet above sea level. The lowest point in the ocean is the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. The lowest point in the Challenger Deep is 36,070 feet below sea level. Weirdly, I thought that this was going to be a much bigger difference when I started researching this question. Maybe because in all our previous episodes when we talk about the ocean the conclusion is that the ocean is way bigger than i thought it was <laughs> and so i'm like oh it's just like 30 percent. i didn't do the math here like 30 percent taller which is actually isn't too much of a big deal the only thing i could really find that cares about like this elevation difference would be um like commercial airliners because they typically cruise between 31 and 38 thousand feet so they go right over everest by a good 2,000 foot margin but they're going to want to. They're going to have to watch out for uh, Mount Challenger Deep here now in the in the big landmass. We'll just put one of those blinky lights on it. Yeah, one of those big red lights, and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like over all of it, like because yeah. you kind of you don't want it to. Oh yeah, I don't know how how big it is. Yeah, you're gonna need a lot of them. But generally, it should be fairly easy for an airplane to avoid a giant ass <laughs> mountain. But so I was like, okay, so maybe it's not, so it's it's a bit taller, but maybe that's not the important bit. Let's look at how steep it is because I got this mental image. If you got this Marion Trench, just kind of like charging you know straight down into the ocean so the mariana trench going kind of going along it in google maps trying to find where it looks the steepest kind of the narrow portion i found was it's about 60 kilometers wide and in that space it goes from a depth of 2300 meters to 10,800 meters so that is a slope of one to seven which is not very steep not that's not seven to one that's one to seven do you know what, what, like, degrees, in degrees, what that is? No, but imagine this. Like, take a ruler, like a foot-long ruler. Yes. A- and put it seven feet away from you. Like, so, like, a pretty, think a narrow room, and you have a one-foot line on the wall across. And then put, like, a plank across the entire room. That's how steep the trench is. Yeah, it's not as dramatic as I imagine in my head. Yeah, I was kind of really disappointed, I'll say. <laughs> 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 I feel like I've been lied to. And, like... You know, I, I, find, I was, like, looking through, and I'm like, oh, here's, like, an elevation profile that looks really steep. And the first comment on it is, like, this view is extremely exaggerated vertically. I'm like, oh, damn. <laughs> so I feel like I've been lied to what trenches look like. That said, I, it's, not all, it's not all lost here. Because um, there, there are pretty extreme ocean features, just not the Challenger Deep. The wall in St. Croix is a better one. So this is a pretty popular um, scuba diving and snorkeling spot. And basically, you have, like, a quarter mile of nice uh, Caribbean beach that's, like, you know, nice and warm. You have the coral reefs. You look at all the fish, and it's, like, pretty shallow. And then there's a 
two mile deep vertical wall that just cut straight down to the ocean floor. Whoa. Like just, I had a, one of my coworkers was there and he was saying, it's just like, he like freaked out because he had like drifted over it. And it's just like the water got like noticeably colder, like at like this wall almost. And then it's just like darkness below you, like no light hits <laughs> the bottom. And I'm just like, oh, that is creepy. So that would now be above the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to imagine a two mile high yeah, wall. Yeah, just a wall. Just standing right? at the bottom of it. It just goes so very, very high. <laughs> and then uh, in addition to that, I stumbled into uh, another ocean trench, which is almost as deep. Uh, the the Kermatic Trench in the Pacific in the Pacific Ocean, uh, just northeast of New Zealand, is nearly as deep as the, as the Challenger Deep at thirty three thousand feet, but this one actually has a much better slope, so it drops about twenty six thousand feet in fourteen thousand feet, or an average of about a two to one slope. And of course, it's not it's like when you imagine it, two to one, it, it doesn't seem like that much, but it's going to be sections that are vertical and then sections that are a little bit more shallow. It kind of averages over you know a longer distance. So that was kind of more of what I was imagining. So we will have some very steep mountains and one really cool cliff face. I was hoping there would be more ocean drop-offs. Like it might be a more, you know, typical thing that happens in topography. But again, I was lied to because you look at all these uh, these ocean diagrams where you see like the continental slope is where it kind of drops off from the shallows into the deep ocean. And that's pretty consistent along all the shorelines. Only that one has like an average slope of like four degrees and they just make, they just draw it like it's pretty cool, even though it's not cool. You god dang lying geologists. Geog- geologists? Not geologists. Geographists? Uh, I don't think geographers. Ca- cartographers? Might be a geographer. I mean, those are maps. I don't know. <laughs> a land scientist. Land scientist, except also ocean bottom scientists. Yeah. Damn ocean bottom scientists. Beach scientists. No, I think that's different. I think that means you just, like, lucked out into one of those, like, I got a grant to sit on the beach and, like, count turtles or something, but actually I'm just living on an island. <laughs> right. There are other really cool parts to our new topography, though. One key feature that's going to be on our uh, new continent of, I guess, the Atlantic Ocean Land Edition. <laughs> I don't know what we're calling them. <laughs> but in the dead, basically dead center in the Atlantic Ocean is actually the world's largest mountain range, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I mean, it's the mountain range is kind of a uh, misnomer because it's still all underwater. There's like maybe like an island or two, but it's all underwater, dead center of the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of traces the border of the uh, the African tectonic plate, but this thing goes fucking forever. It actually does go um, well. So it kind of goes above the ocean, and I want to say it was either Iceland or Greenland. There's a point where it's basically a valley made by it, where there's just like rock wall on the other side of you where it's sort of you know split across it's pretty cool yeah yeah and it, go, and like, it goes all the way up from greenland down 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 almost to antarctica and then cuts a hard right to the east it goes under africa and into like the indian ocean there um and kind of just like combines with some other mountain ranges going in towards you know between uh india and australia area down there so Altogether, it's 25,000 miles in length is this path this thing traces. And even though it doesn't actually go around the world, that that 25,000 miles happens to also be the circumference of the world. So it's like it, it meanders around an equivalent length of going all the way around the world. So when we flop our elevations around, this mountain range, of course, will no longer be a mountain range. It's effectively going to be a giant lake, a huge lake extending all the way down the center of our continent. Now... I don't know exactly how big this lake is going to be, because there's a couple things that will affect it. One, when you're talking about such a large scale, because it is, you know, miles and miles across. But it is still, like, you know, mountain level steep. So where does the natural pattern of rainfall, you know, actually create lakes, and how much much of it will it pool? And also, like, the amount of soils you have. If you have, like, a deep clay layer, then the water can travel underground as opposed in an aquifer as opposed to above the ground in a lake. There's a lot of questions I don't know, but again, looking through, going around Google Maps, kind of just browsing around the world and elevations, the closest similar feature I could find was the Nile River, because the Nile River also has a, a lot of large areas around it, and then in between is where the Nile River is, so 
The fact that the closest similar feature I could find is the largest river in the world makes me hopeful that there's going to be a giant ass lake going all the way down the middle. So that's going to be pretty sweet. It's going to be like the Mississippi River, like on steroids. And then uh, the last thing I'm going to kind of cover here is holes. Shia LaBeouf? You're going to cover Shia LaBeouf? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so holes, I like holes because, of course, these are not going to naturally form the other way. Like, these are not going to, these are going to be a lot different than your, what your natural uh, features are going to be because they're effectively giant pillars in the sky. So I, I started off, because I kept coming up my research anyway, uh, one big famous hole is the Great Blue Hole off the coast of Belize. Again, another popular uh, scuba diving spot. It's basically a hole, it's a hole hole a thousand feet across that's just kind of right off the shore and it's pretty cool when you look at images they're just like light blue you know again nice tropical waters and then just like a big dark blue spot and so it goes about a thousand feet across and then it goes and it's 425 feet deep so there's supposed to be like this big ass 400 foot mesa right off of uh you know right in the middle of everything which is going to be pretty cool but our show is called Absurd Hypothetical, so I'm not going to settle just for that, you know, fairly reasonable landscape feature. Um, so let's go to the deepest hole in the world, which I think we may have mentioned on the show before. But it, since I can't remember when we did, it must have been a while ago. We talked about a bottom, bottomless hole. Oh, we did talk about that one. That was a lightning round question. <laughs> but uh, this one is a real life hole. It is the Kola Super Deep Bore Hole in Russia. So this was a hole made for research to kind of study the Earth's crust. The process was basically, they drilled a 9-inch diameter hole 7.6 miles into the earth. So they just kept drilling and drilling and drilling. Uh, I, I forget why they shut down. There's a, there a story behind it. They but, went too uh, deep. They went too deep. <laughs> Tiny demons started crawling out. 9-inch diameter demons. 9-inch <laughs> yeah, diameter demons. That's my 9-inch nails most... cover band. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers, they're mostly snake demons. Uh... But anyway, let, let's flip this one around, because now we have a nine-inch tall pillar shooting up sh into the stratosphere that's located in the middle of the ocean. Hey, Marcus, you built a space elevator again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! no! I don't think you're going to be able to attach anything. This thing, of course, will never manage to stand. But if it did, this would be the thing that we're going to have to attach all those red lights to, because this will <laughs> definitely be in the flight zone. And now, instead of, like, a big mountain, it's just, like, this one little nine-inch diameter pole that you would, you know... Go ahead and sever your plane in half. I mean, you just touch it and it falls apart, right? It's going to fall apart under its own. It's going to buckle under its yeah. own weight. Ab absolutely no chance at standing. But for a very brief moment, it'll be very funny. And, you know, maybe someone is the person who who dies by getting hit by a piece of the borehole, which would just be like, you know, what, the most unlikely, but still kind of an awesome way to go. But yeah, those are the uh, the cool landscape features I got. Chris, what did you cover? So you covered land, I covered water, so the water side of things. Wait, that's not going to be much for Ben, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I will figure something Whatever. out. <laughs> Ignore the scribbling as Ben frantically rewrites his answer while Chris goes. <laughs> yeah. So currently, obviously, there's more water on Earth than there is land. So the surface area of Earth is 197 million square miles and 78. Or seventy point eight percent of that is water, so the other twenty nine point two percent is land. So that's a, like a pretty big difference between land and water. And then if you look at the volume of land and water versus area, I actually found like the average uh, land elevation of like mountains and just everything above sea level, and the average elevation is two thousand seven hundred and fifty six feet. Uh, if you multiply that by the surface area of the land, that means that the total volume of land above sea level is 30 million cubic miles of land. I did the same thing for oceans, uh, just like the average depth, and the volume of water that we have is 318 million cubic miles of water. So it's like a much bigger difference if you're looking at volume. So if in our scenario, if they swap... That means that our water is dropping from 318 million to 30 million cubic miles of water, which is a 90% reduction of water. 
That's not good. <laughs> it's not good. It's very <laughs> significant. So first, I want to look at like how does this reduction of water affect marine life? It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I said those average elevations and average depths. Obviously, in this swap scenario, the average depth of the ocean becomes a lot less. It goes from 12,000 to 2,000. So I want to see like, is there any deep sea life at all? And does that matter if we lose that? So it turns out there's very little deep sea life right now. And that's because as you get deeper in the ocean, there's really high pressures. There's basically no sunlight because it's just blocked by the water. It doesn't get all the way down there. It's extremely cold and there's very little food. So it's like not very good for, for creatures to live down there. But there are some creatures. So Marcus mentioned the Challenger Deep, which is in the Mariana Trench. I actually got a different depth than you did. I don't. What was the depth that you said? I had thirty six thousand feet below sea level. Oh, so you just rounded up, I guess. I got thirty five thousand eight hundred fifty six feet. Oh uh, well, mine was mine was a plus minus of like you know some number of feet too. So they're like, we don't fucking know. Yeah. I think it might be hard to measure how deep things are when you're when they're miles away. <laughs> Well, yeah. Huh. They said you know that... you drop your you drop your bobber down from the boat, and it's just like you got a wave that's like. <laughs> well, no, because they've they, they've traveled down there before, so well, they yeah. measured it. I, I don't know how accurate that measurement is, but whatever. Apparently, it's deep. Plus or minus a few hundred feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when they did travel down there, they actually saw. I think they caught it on camera. They they saw sea cucumbers, a scale worm, a bristle worm, and a shrimp. That's what they found down there. One shrimp. Yeah. Well, I think all those were just one of each of those. Yeah, it's pretty pretty sparse down there, I think. Yeah. So there is some life. <laughs> it's not that much, but there's some. And then microbial life actually thrives down there a lot too because I guess they're very adaptable in extreme conditions. Also, if you don't if all of you find a shrimp, you're like, "Uh, I guess I'll check if there's also any microbial life so somebody'll <laughs> be excited." <laughs> yeah. So we're we're actually losing this this deepest part of the ocean, but Mount Everest is 29,000 feet. So it's pretty close to that depth. So we're not really losing the deep that like the depth of the ocean that much. We still have deep ocean. It's just that the average is higher. So we have less of a deep ocean. And we don't really need that much deep ocean because not many creatures live down there anyway. Yeah, we'll just consolidate them. Yeah. It, it works twofold because, you know, we get some of our you know, we don't need as much deep ocean. We're waste, we're wasting all our empty space with that. And so, and they're put them together and there's going to be more wildlife now in the deep ocean. So when we go down there and actually check it out for all those dollars, there's going to be more shrimp. We might see three shrimp. <laughs> sure. So deep sea life isn't very common, but life is way more common in what's called the photic zone. So like 90% of marine life is in this photic zone. And the depth of the photic zone depends on the clarity of water because it's defined by the amount of sunlight that gets through the water. So as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, the amount of sunlight or the strength of the sunlight drops. And once it drops below 1% of the surface strength of sunlight, that's when they consider you're not in the photic zone anymore. And this average, like the depth of this average is, or it varies depending on um, the clarity of water, but the like... In open ocean, it can be as deep as 650 feet. So the average depth of our ocean now is 2,700 feet. So we were way past that photic zone anyway. So our marine life is pretty much okay. Total waste of ocean deepness. <laughs> this is why we're having. This is why we're having so much global warming around. Is we're wasting all our ocean deepness. <laughs> we got to consolidate <laughs> that ocean deepness. If we had more ocean deepness now, we could have more. We could have saved that ocean deepness and use it now. To make deeper oceans that could absorb more heat and reduce global warming, but we didn't. <laughs> Poor planning on our part. Yeah, this is bull. It's totally BS. up to us. Why do we got to pay the price of previous generations like this? <laughs> um. Anyway, so even though the we're okay with the depth in terms of marine life, they can live in that 650 feet depth. We still do reduce the amount of surface area of water that we have. So, like we have less of that photic zone anyway. And and the surface area reduces by 58%. So which, that means that one of two things is probably going to happen. Either the population density doubles or just half of the marine life dies. 
I'm going to say more likely that half of marine life dies. Yeah, it's probably the more likely choice. But so that's the, so that's how the reduction of water affects marine life. But how does it affect stuff that's happening on land? So you've probably heard of the, the water cycle. The water evaporates, it condenses into clouds, and then it moves somewhere else, and it rains, and it's a cycle. I just imagine, like, the way you said that, I imagine you, like, going door to door, like, p- pitching it like a religion, just like, have you heard about the water cycle? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a bit about it. I want to convert you. Can we, actually, this is a good idea. I'm going to stop your answer for a second. Can we, can we, like, do door to door science? Like, hey, some people don't understand <laughs> that the earth is round. We're, here's some science. Can we explain it to you? Like, we want everyone to know this. Just generally informing the public. Just perform a public service. We just knock on someone's door. It's like, hey, do you want to hear about this cool thing today? And they say yes or no. And if you, they say, yeah, come on in, you you, you teach them a little, little third grade science. Okay. I guess that could be a thing. You can do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I kind of I kind of love this, but also, yeah, I would not do this. <laughs> I wouldn't say yeah, but I know all the science already. Thanks, podcast. <laughs> yeah, just listen to our podcast. You don't need that. You can't expect everyone to do such a well peer reviewed podcast like ours. <laughs> I mean, we are basically the digital version of that. So, um, anyway, currently in our not swapped world, 104 cubic miles of water evaporates each year in the entire world. Now that varies depending on like what the temperature is, what where you are in the world, and like what the climate is like. But that's like the average number. So. With a less volume, so now with the now that we've swapped, we have less water. That means less water is going to be evaporating each year, and it doesn't actually depend on the volume of water that we have because volume has decreased by ninety percent. It is more dependent on the surface area, so we've reduced by fifty-eight percent, which means that only forty-four cubic miles of water is going to evaporate each year. So it's a significant reduction of the amount of rain that we're going to get. And then the water that does evaporate, 80% of that evaporated water fall, rains back into the ocean currently. Wasteful. Why? Who's designing this? <laughs> yeah, I know. Who's in charge of ocean deepness and rain Who's in charge of Earth? <laughs> the ocean doesn't need it. <laughs> it's already all water. It's, it's as wet as it's going to get. <laughs> now, if the surface area of the ocean is smaller, does this mean that that percentage is going to decrease and no that's not what's going to happen because it's evaporating from the ocean and it needs to move away from the ocean in order to do that but what is going to happen is that marcus mentioned that at the shores there is like a a drop or like a slope increase and he said it's kind of gradual but even though it is gradual it's still pretty significant in our in terms of the scale that we're talking about and what happens is that if a cloud hits a mountain, then it like pushes the cloud up into higher altitudes um, and it decreases the pressure and it makes it rain on the windward side of the mountain, which in our case would be the side pointing at the ocean. So it rains on that side of the mountain and then it just drains back into the ocean. On the leeward side of the mountain, there's it's not getting any rain at all. So it becomes dry and arid and that's actually how how like deserts form and that's that effect is called the rain shadow so that's not good yeah (laughs) so as an example of that in the u.s here the cascade mountain range is in the west side of the u.s and it creates a rain shadow over almost all of nevada and parts of utah so it's just like an example of a rain shadow and the highest peak of the cascades is at an elevation of 14,411 feet now, our average elevation in a swapped world is 12,000 feet. So it's pretty close to that peak elevation of the Cascades. And then we at the shores, we have that climb up to that average. It's going to vary depending on where you are, obviously, because it's just an average number. But overall, there's going to be this mountain that climbs up to 12,000 feet at the shores. Which means that around the perimeter of all of our land, we're going to have a continuous rain shadow. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. <laughs> so that means that pretty much all the water is going to drain back into the ocean and none of it is going to migrate out into 
we have like all this we have way more land than we used to but it's none of it is going to get any rain it's all going to be completely desert so like in terms of like where we're going to live and stuff it's probably going to be like on the shores because it's the only source of water yeah it's not really looking good for my mid-atlantic ridge uh big old river lake because <laughs> <laughs> it's collecting all the water from all everything around it and that amount of water is not any water <laughs> It's yeah. <laughs> not going to really be a big old lake now, is it? I mean, there's some water in there, right? You said that it goes above sea level at some point? Well, no. I mean, the Mid-Atlantic Ridges does not... It, like, barely goes above sea level like at, like, a point or two in New Zealand. Like, they would be, like... But the majority of it is, like, you know, 2,000 feet below. Okay. So it'd be, like, a super big valley and then just, like, a tiny bit of water on the bottom? Yeah, if it was popping up in the ocean, we would there'd be a very famous island chain uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that just goes top to bottom, which there is not. You may have heard of it if it existed. <laughs> mm, <okay. laughs> but anyway, that was my answer. Ben, what did you do? So I, my original plan was... Land or water, first off. Did you do land or water? Uh, I guess it's more land, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I did mud, actually, is my... My answer. Ooh, we did no. a combination. I did not. That's a lie. Um, <laughs> so I was going to look at navigation across this world and um, specifically looking at, like, colonization and stuff. Because, obviously, when colonization was happening, you know, it was these these voyages across the ocean, which would now be voyages across this mountainous desert area. But then I realized that in order to look at, like, colonization specifically... I had to figure out where people would actually be um, <laughs> to see where they're trying to get. So I started with that. So so like Chris said, you know, about 29% of the surface area of the world now is land. And about 71% is water. Um, so just looking at that, we have about two and a half much times, two and a half times as much space for people, which seems like, you know, a good place to be. The problem is you really can't just look at total land mass because even with our existing world, we don't use all of the land we have. There's kind of different amounts of land we use based on how you look at it. So a couple of the ones I saw, the the Food and Agriculture uh, Organization of the United Nations did a thing in 2014 called the Land Cover Share Database. And there they flagged... so. They call them artificial services, which were any areas that had an artificial cover as a result of human activities, which would be construction, so cities, town, transportation, things like that, mines and quarries, or waste disposal. That was only 0.6% of the land surface on the planet. If you include cropland as well, that goes up to about 13%. But still, that's a pretty small amount of the, the available land that we're actually using now. So I want to figure out sort of you know, you can't exactly use those numbers to see just how much land we have now because some of that is based on, you know, where people settled down. So how do we figure out where people actually live? And so to do that, I found a data set from the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia University that basically took... Oh, no, someone gave Ben a big data set. Oh, I found so <laughs> many cool data sets, dude. It was great. I wish I found it earlier. Before we started recording, he told me about this data set, and I was like, he, could, he said I could use it to find, like, the average elevation. I was like, no, I just Googled the average elevation. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess you could do that, too, but this would be cooler. <laughs> All right, anyway, point being, um, what this one did was basically they took, they took like, global census data and then mapped it out and basically gave you, it, it's effectively, there was more complicated aspects of it, but what I was mostly using was basically just population density by, like, grid on the map. Um, and looking at that, if I had actually been able to pull the data down and get to it earlier, I probably could have gotten, um, gotten a more exact number. But eyeballing it, it looks like the vast majority of the population of the planet is between 6 degrees north, sorry, 60 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude. So sort of for context, that's like, in North America, that's like the base of Alaska or like the tip of uh, Greenland. And then in Europe, that's like, the tip of Norway or sort of like the midline of Russia, everything below that. And then 30 degrees south is like the base of Brazil in South America and up. And then like just the tip off of Africa and up. And then most of Australia. You're missing the bottom like quarter of Australia. That's just 
Mostly kangaroos. I mean, ironically, I think that's actually where most of the population in Australia lives, but they can move up. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> point. All right, cool. Nice, sick burn. Um, Bam. <laughs> suck it, Australia. Um, <laughs> they can't do anything. They're so far away. They have to, they have to fly for like 14 hours and then punch me. No one's going to do that. Yeah. So that gives us kind of a good, you know, when we're looking at our new water as land, land as water world, a good idea of where people people could actually live just based on, you know, the climate of those elevations. Or not elevations, sorry, latitudes. Elevations. This was actually, I thought this was going to be hard to find, finding like population by elevation. It's actually pretty easy for a kind of sad reason. It's because people are researching how many people will get screwed over by um, like rising water from global warming. <laughs> Oh. Um, so actually a pretty good amount of research on this at this point. And I found a chart of population distribution by altitude from Radical Cartography, which is actually a pretty cool website that I was looking through some. And from there, half of the world's population lives below 165 meters, which is 541 feet. And 94% of it lives below 1,600 meters, which is about a mile. So once again, we can kind of say that like 1,600 meters or a mile is kind of our like upper limit here on where people can reasonably live um, just from, you know, real, real world example. So we have our latitude boundaries. We have our elevation boundary, I guess. How much land do we have once we flip the ocean? Looking at latitude, we're pretty okay. Once again, I don't have an exact number on this, but eyeballing it, I would say that probably 60% of the ocean is in that latitude range. So that gives us like 83 million square miles of land mass, which is a little more than we have now in total land mass. So that's cool. When we look at elevation, we kind of run into a bit of an issue, which there was another, another data set from that same center at Columbia University that looked at like satellite, you know, polled elevation numbers. And the problem we run into very quickly is that once you get past the coast, pretty much all of the oceans drop off to 4,000 meters or so, which is far beyond our um, upper bound there. Yeah, it's kind of low. Down. It's kind of deep, the ocean. Yeah. That's what, <laughs> that's what I expect to find most times. I'm like, the ocean's big, right? Don't don't lie. Don't tell me this whole podcast has been a lie. Right, exactly. Yeah, it is big, it turns out. I try to find, like, exact numbers on on where that drop out hap- or, yeah, drop off happens to see, you know, how much land we'd have to work with. They don't really exist. I think it very much depends on where you are. The one I could find, I found a, a map from, it was like like the Virginia and Delaware coast where their drop-off is. And it looks like about 100 miles out from the shore, it dropped to 1,600 meters or a mile, which was our upper bound. So at least there, we go from, we have, you know, a 100-mile strip along the coastline that's like a livable elevation and latitude. So... Really what it comes down to, I guess also, to be fair, I looked into the mid-ocean ridges as well and kind of wound up in the same place that Chris did, where I had this hope that, okay, these, depending on where you are in them, they're somewhere between 2,000 and 1,000 meters. So maybe if we're lucky, like there's spots where you could live, but then I kind of ran into the same thing where both sides are going to have like, you know, four to five to 8,000 meter tall, like plateaus that are just going to block off any hope of getting water or anything um, and make it impossible to actually, you know, get there reasonably, probably. Yeah, it's not good. (laughs) So really, I think we kind of do just have like, I'm going to say 50 to 100 miles of coastline along sort of both like sets of continents, which really isn't that much room, which... Sort of looping back to my sort of original plan, where are people going to live? <laughs> not not that many places, actually, is kind of what I wound up on. <laughs> so on the whole colonization thing, I don't actually think we're going to have enough space to make civilizations that will colonize, which is kind of a good thing if you think about it, and also not great. So we're, just gonna, we're all just going to live in a small, dank place by the ocean where it rains all the time. Yeah, pretty much. So England. Yes, <laughs> basically, yes. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, there was something that that I I don't really have anywhere to go with this. I just kind of want to bring it up because it just seems really cool to me and also might make the planet inhabitable in long term. We're going to go back in time a little bit. 
we're going to go back 335 million to 175 million years ago. We're going to go back to Pangea, <laughs> where all of the continents were one supercontinent, which now is just one giant ocean in the middle of the planet surrounded entirely by a massive, massive, massive desert. I don't, I have no idea what this looks like. I don't know if it even like, I, I don't know. I, I honestly try to figure out like what, if this would even be possible. I don't think it is. I think that there's just not enough. There wouldn't be enough like moisture to have an atmosphere around the planet. I don't I don't know. I have no idea how this would work. I try to like Google planets that have one giant ocean surrounded by land. And I I mean, we don't know that much about other planets, so I couldn't find anything, obviously. But like <laughs> it's also a really weird Google query. Right, okay. Google, can you show me all the giant Very specific. oceans no, surrounded by real? land planets, please? I spent so long trying to figure out how to Google this. Because <laughs> I just couldn't figure it out. Oh, so you spent a lot of time and ended up on, hey, Google, is there any planets with a big ocean surrounded by land? Yes, what I'm planets? saying is that that was my best option. <laughs> um, but yeah, so honestly, like thinking back to that, I don't know really if life would even form the way it did on Earth. Probably not. Because you would just have, you know, basically around Pangea, this stretch of habitable land where you have access to water and then nothing else i mean i think life would still form yeah but probably not develop to the point that it is now i would guess right yeah the mental image is also just like mind-boggling because it's just like literally probably at least a third is entirely in inha- like inhabitable desert of the planet during pangea which is kind of crazy so that's kind of what i had honestly it's a little depressing. Yeah, that's cause... good. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> well, it's not everyone dies. It's just er- no one. No one exists. exists. I mean, <laughs> is that better than everyone dies? <laughs> I don't know. I think yes. I think, yeah, I think yes. So. It's a little more existential, a little less actually like terrible. So, you know, improvement? I don't know. Yeah, we're getting less less deadly. So we didn't end up in an episode where nobody dies, huh? Even though I promised in the beginning, Ben. Even though I said right at the start, this one is going to be one where nobody dies. Do you remember that one? Do you remember when I said that? Yeah, I I thought about saying something then, but I decided to just go ahead and <laughs> let you have your fun and think that was going to be true. <laughs> I was like to make a point that was not like a stage joke. It was not. Like, I literally was just like, oh, actually, hey, we're not going to kill anybody this time. This is great. Oh, how little you knew. You guys ready for a would you rather question? Mm-hmm. Chris. Yes. Would you rather Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or the Easter Bunny be real? Um. Huh. Oh, this feels like an easy, easy... Oh, wait. Hold on. Maybe not. <laughs> I would say... So do I own them or they just do their own thing? Like what they're actually known for? I think they just do their they own do thing. They do what they're known yeah. for. Okay. So I would prefer to have the Easter Bunny because the Easter Bunny gives you stuff. So, okay, that was my first thought, too. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I, that was my thought, too, and I ended on the opposite Here's side. the problem. So, yes, Rudolph on his own, don't do shit. It's just a glowing reindeer. We have those in Chernobyl already. So, the Easter Bunny, I thought that, too. It was like, oh, hey, cool, I'll get chocolate. But the Easter Bunny doesn't actually bring chocolate, right? He just hides eggs. That seems bad. That is not good. Well, the eggs have stuff in them, right? Well... I mean, well, a lot of them are also just eggs. Yeah. Like, I don't know about your Easter egg hunts, but I usually do, like, we usually have hard boiled eggs. Right. So there's just going to be a bunch of eggs all over the place. That seems pretty bad. I like hard boiled eggs. But do you like hard boiled eggs that have been hidden around the world for some indeterminate period of time? You have to find them before they go bad. Yeah. That's the real, that's the real kicker of the whole thing is that hiding the Easter eggs is fun and great and you get a nice egg breakfast. But also, usually, you know, two to three people in the household know exactly where all the eggs are. So 45 minutes after the, you know, everyone gets bored of looking for them, you just go and collect all the eggs and you don't have to worry about it. What if the eggs are actually hidden? First off, do you think you know how many eggs are hidden? Do you think that you get an empty carton that's like, okay, I hit a dozen eggs. I hit your place with a dozen eggs. <laughs> I, like, I like the idea that you wake up in the morning and and like you go to your front porch and there's just an egg carton there. And you're like, honey, he's back. <laughs> he's struck again. Oh, honey, he left a freaking family pack of 36 eggs here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I guess that's work that you have to do every day. Well, not, 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 every, not every day, day, just on Easter. Yeah. Oh, just on Easter, right. 
That's how the Easter Bunny works. <laughs> you don't, do you hide eggs every so day? So what did he do? Family? What did he do when it's not Easter? I guess he makes a lot of eggs. I guess, I guess he produces. I would assume he spends that time producing eggs. <laughs> I okay. Can we just please clear up for a second? Do we think that the Easter Bunny, like biologically produces them or does he go and buy eggs and then like hard boil them and dye them i think that's the lore right the lore is that he biologically produces the eggs i think huh uh okay this raises another question the easter bunny (laughs) lay eggs if the easter bunny is real would you eat easter bunny eggs yeah it wouldn't be chicken eggs okay so the original the traditional um the origin of the easter bunny is from a german traditional story of the egg laying hare okay so yeah so would you eat easter bunny eggs they're not chicken eggs the children made nests in which this creature could lay its colored eggs that's so much worse (laughs) i hate this i hate this a lot (laughs) you set up a can you imagine you wake up you set a nest up and you wake up in the morning and there's a fucking rabbit just laying colorful eggs in it that's horrible (laughs) i hate it (laughs) I imagine they taste similar to chicken eggs, though, even though but, they aren't chicken eggs. But rabbit, let's assume they're good eggs. Let's, meat, assume they're, let's, assume they're, let's assume they're better than average eggs. Rabbit meat tastes kind of gamey. So maybe they t- kind of like gamey tasting eggs, which sounds disgusting to me personally. That would be like magical, though. No, 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 no. no. We, have to, we, have to make, we have to make the eggs good and delicious because otherwise we'll never talk about Rudolph. <laughs> okay, fair. Yeah, yeah, what are the ups and downs of Rudolph? He kind of just does his own thing, though. He doesn't, like, give people anything. He's just going to be flying on Christmas and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, I think the Rudolph is just, like, you have the knowledge that there is a reindeer that can fly and has a glowing nose. And also, it's a bit insecure. Hmm. <laughs> without a lot, yeah, a glowing reindeer without a lot of confidence. But does he, like, interact with humans at all? Probably not. So nothing really changes? No. Here's the thing. Here's, here's the one downside about Rudolph. So Rudolph, Rudolph is a regular reindeer who happens to be able to fly. He is not a magical immortal reindeer, so at some point Rudolph is going to die. And I given your like choice between immortal. introducing an immortal Easter bunny and a Rudolph fancy reindeer, you basically you're introducing magic into the world, and one of them is going to die, and then there's going to be no magic left. I'm going to argue the other that going to be Easter. Bunny. Rudolph is at least very long life because I feel like what is hold on what is I would argue that both Santa's, of them are immortal. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't think Rudolph's a very long lived. How old can reindeer get? I'm going to Google this. Hold on. In my mind, they're both like magical creatures that live forever. Okay, reindeer live 15 to 18 years. And we have been talking about Rudolph for far more than 15 to 18 years. So I would argue that he is at least, I mean, not a standard mortality reindeer. Rudolph is 81 years old. Rudolph has never died in any stories. So <laughs> canonically, I feel Rudolph like he's is immortal. immortal. <laughs> This is the dumbest conversation we ever had in this show. <laughs> <laughs> is Rudolph immortal? Is the great is a great conversation. I don't know. Why this is what people tune in for? I mean, I think whatever you apply to Rudolph, you have to apply to the Easter Bunny. Right. Too. I think they play by the same rules. I think they're both immortal. Yeah. Okay. In I that case, so too. in that case, is the is the egg hunt better and more fun because you can participate as an adult? You don't know where the eggs are because Easter egg hunts are fun. It, it is fun if somebody else has the egg and you go and find them. It is a fun little activity. But you also should get someone else to hide the eggs. Like, you could designate one egg hider <laughs> if you want to do this. We don't do that. Well, because it's, it's, it's weird. Nobody does any, like, thing unless they have an excuse to have an event of some sort. Fair. All right. I'm just saying, if someone did all the work for me, like, if I just woke up and I was like, one day in the week, I get free eggs and I get to do a fun little egg hunt in the morning. Do yeah, I want to do that? If it's only once a year, then sure. Why not? It's fun. And then there's going to be a lot of fun stories about people who found all but one of the eggs. And like, where the fuck is it? <laughs> it's going to stink <laughs> up my house a week from I, now. I have, yeah. I have a question. So I know traditionally Easter egg hunts are outdoors. Would eggs be hidden indoors? Yeah, I, I mean, my family does indoor eggs too. How does that work? Because now I'm terrified. <laughs> uh, does a bunny sneak in? Well, it's the same thing as Santa. But there's a difference between a jolly human man... <laughs> <laughs> why enough in my house to give me presents and a terrifying is it a giant bunny or a regular sized bunny uh i think it's a bigger than average bunny. bigger than i would average put him bunny. at like i'd put him at like a, like he would his ears might be like slightly past your hips on height wise so like three feet tall with ears. i don't think i like that that makes do me... you just have to make sure the opposite of santa where you have to make sure you absolutely do not fucking wake up to go see the easter <laughs> right you just can't see it happen <laughs> just you just have like a, you just like go like you just take like a fucking like alka or like you know nighttime tablets and take like five of them, and you just make sure you're comatose for like 
12 hours. I mean, I don't think you really have to worry about that that much. I think, like, by the rules of the Easter Bunny, you don't really see him ever. Hmm. It's just a magical... Oh, if you magically don't see them, it's... I guess, yeah, you know what? No one tries to catch the Easter Bunny. You only try to catch Santa. Not, like, capture, but, like, And even if you try to catch the Easter Bunny, you're unsuccessful. Even if you have cameras in your house, like, they they black out for, like, the time that he's in the Yeah, they they just... The feet get replaced by, like, like, tie-dye colors. You know, as... As as horrible as it is, the the idea of a real Easter Bunny, I think I'm in for the egg hunt. I'm gonna vote for the Easter Bunny. I it want is, the Easter Bunny real because I get the. Egg. It is just once a year. Yeah, if it was every day or even every week, I would say no. But once I think a year, once is fine. a year, yeah, I can handle. Also, I'm pretty confident in my egg finding abilities, and I think I'm gonna have a lot of good Schadenfreude of people who cannot find their eggs and their houses get stunk up. And I'm like, ha, idiot. I, I feel like it would. It would also force me to be a lot more tidy, too, which is nice to have fewer egg hiding places. So really nothing changes with Rudolph? We, uh, that pretty much, something. yeah. I mean, I don't think there is. You could catch him. You could you could become Rudolph's owner if you are, if you find him. I guess some people would do that, like with Bigfoot. Yeah, it's like the Where's Waldo. But like, your odds are both better and worse in that it's better the chance of finding him because he does exist, but a worse chance of catching him because he can fly. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Man, is someone gonna try and shoot Rudolph? God damn it! I feel like they are. I, mean, I can't pick Rudolph. I feel like that. I feel like someone would succeed pretty quickly. I can't subject Rudolph to the hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go with the Easter Bunny. Yeah, I got the Easter Bunny. This seems like the clear, the clear option here. We are ignoring our gut reaction, which is sometimes problematic if this if these choices actually mattered. But I'm in for it. Uh, and with that, that brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes but you happen to be listening to this one if you didn't like this one but like the other ones you can still go on to our patreon uh www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals and you can give money to the show is that so great that we give you guys the opportunity to give us money um but you go in there's only one tier one patreon tier you get all the stuff uh it is one dollar so you know for one fifth the price of, of your daily morning coffee you can support our show and with that support, you get access to our behind-the-scenes episodes where we go into the how we make the show, go over our last month of questions and kind of say what we really thought about each other's answers, and sometimes there's little bonus things. Like last month, I added a bit to one of our answers that I promised I would, so you get some cool stuff like that. We also have special guests on our last behind-the-scenes episode, so plenty of exciting things to happen there, but you do have to give us one-fifth of a coffee first. So www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals. Go there, do the things. And either way, join us next week where we do a boozy grab bag of questions. <laughs>